you know, J24 is kind of a dinghy. That's what I learned to sail on. Then I raced sunfish for a long time, uh, lasers. Tried to do vanguards and broke my knee. And I can't, when you can't bend your knee, you can't get into those small boats anymore. So that was the end of that. Um, and then I've been involved in a couple of really successful uh, programs in my own boats over the years. So what do we think about? We're going to jump right into this. Right up here, I have boat prep. What do we do to make sure our boat's ready? What's the first thing we do in the spring? Come on. Someone's going to have an idea. Hmm? Uncover your boat. Obviously, if you covered your boat, you did something right the year before. Uh, but uncovering your boat's important. Because now you're starting, you're starting to think about sailing. You're starting to think about things. And then we work on the bottom. We wax the top sides. Now, bottoms. Now, people don't take seriously uh, a good bottom or know what a good bottom or a bad bottom is. I have some things that I'm going to show you. Everybody have one of these at home? Feel that. Does your boat feel like that? Does your boat feel like that? We'll, we'll pass it around. Is, if your boat, the bottom of your boat feel like that? There are bottoms that feel like this, like here, right? You know, you know, guys all know what I'm talking about. Everybody's got one of these or seen an old one, and it's all crusty. And there's been a blade of paint put on the bottom of your boat. And it comes off in chunks. Not fast. Not prepared. And this is probably the, the next most common texture of a, of a bottom. So we'll just pass it, just you know, pass it around. It's a, little, it, it's a little smoother. It's not real bumpy, but it's not smooth to the touch. My last prop for this. Everybody's got one of these. Nice Teflon frying pan. This is what the bottom of your boat should look like and feel like. Not Maybe not look like it, but definitely feel like it. And if you want to come up and feel this one, I'll pass that around as well. Why is boat bottom preparation important? It's resistance. It's, it's slow and it, the smoother the bottom, the faster you go through the water. Now, is, any dinghy sailors here, small boats? It, you don't, might not put bottom paint on your boat, but it's got to be smooth, right? So if it's smooth, that's great. That's not holding you back. If it's not smooth, it's holding you back. Three-tenths of a knot, does that mean anything to anybody? When you're sailing for two hours, three-tenths of a knot adds up. And you're that much further behind and further behind. Your boat's not fast. And what do we do to keep our boat bottoms in good shape all year long? Hmm? Clean them. Either clean it ourselves, pull the boat out of the water and clean it, have, hire a diver. I, we have our boat every week. A diver goes and scrubs the bottom of my boat every week. It's not cheap, but nothing in this sport is cheap, really, when you think about it. And in this sport. <laughs> and in a lot of sports, not, it's not cheap. But the point is, is you want to present your best foot forward. You don't want to start behind. You want to start on an even, key, on an even keel, so there's no pun intended, but it's there. You want to start even with everybody else. You don't want to give anybody else an advantage by something that you're not doing. And people really underestimate the value of a well-prepared bottom, you know, sanded, smooth. Now, you don't have to go crazy. Um, you don't have to. You can still use a blade of paint. Is a blade of paint as fast as the non-ablative paint? 
like DC Offshore or Black Widow? No, those are faster paints because they're smoother. They require more maintenance during the year. They need the diver every week. So if you have a blade of paint, you might not need it every week, especially in, in when the water's cold, like it is today. Um, as the water gets warmer, stuff grows on the bottom of the boat. And that green slime, it's not fast. I got to tell you, it's not fast. So the first thing we have is we did a bottom, right? What else is important? Hmm? Rigging. Your boat has to be, what would you say? Rigging. Rigging. That's my next top, top topic, actually. Is your rigging in good shape? Yes or no? Do you know? Do you have it checked? Is, it gonna, is, it, is the mask going to fall down in the middle of a race? That's definitely not fast, right? <laughs> Having your rig tuned properly is probably the second thing, most important thing that you can do to make your boat fast. A poorly tuned rig will not perform the way you want because you can't trim the sails. I mean, you, if you get into all these sail trim seminars and concepts and you, you're trying to uh, move the draft back and forward or, or you know, open the leech, close the leech. If you're, if you're tuned improperly, those things are impossible. And when you tack from one side to the other, you will have differences. And then you, oh, I'm better on starboard tack than I'm on port tack. Well, there's a reason. Some boats, some boats, it's unavoidable by the way the boat's designed. But most boats will be very similar if they're tuned properly on port and starboard tack. If you think you're going slow, you probably are. Um, what, else, what else is important besides rigging? Standing rigging, you got the running ring, the lines, right? If you have bad lines, Not a good line, <laughs> right? Sometimes you see this in the middle of the line, like this. Something wrong with that, right? Is there anything wrong with that? Yeah, there's a lot wrong with that. It's old. Actually, this one, the rest of the line isn't in bad shape. You can cut this line. You can cut the bad part off and still have a halfway decent uh, dock line. Dock lines are important, but before we get into lines, we're going to get into, into lines. What about, what else do we do in the spring when we get on a boat? When we take our cover off, we do the bottom, we wax the boat maybe, right? Service so it's, your hmm? Service your winches. Service your winches. That's, that's part of it. If your winches don't turn properly, it's going to slow you down. What about... Cleaning the boat, is that important? The outside, the inside. And we're going to get into this later when we talk about crew. But nobody wants to go on a dirty boat. Nobody wants to go on an ugly boat. Everybody wants to go on the nice, shiny, doesn't have to be a new boat, but as long as it's shiny and clean. Now, every once in a while, it rains and their decks get a little messed up and we hold, we wash the deck and it goes away. I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about rust stains and, and grime and things on the boat that are supposed to spin that don't spin because it's, they're corroded and there's too much dirt in the way. Those are the things that turn people off. Right? So clean boat inside, clean boat outside. You don't have to have the fanciest boat. If it's clean, people will be happy. If it's not clean, how many people here crew? There's a lot of people. Do you want to get on a dirty boat? What do you think about? Someone tell me what they think about when they get on a boat that just doesn't look right. It's not going to be. It's not going to be fun, right? Things are broken. Should they be fixed, or should we nah, let them go? That's got another week in it. 
That line's got another three pulls on it before it'll snap. That's a bad attitude. <laughs> you know. Um, when should we replace lines? When should we replace, you know, shackles? And when should we replace uh, blocks? When they look bad, it's probably time to clean them, try to clean them up. If, if that doesn't work, it's time to get a new one. When, when you're just out cruising around, you know, and a block fails, you roll up the sails, you come back in. When you're racing and things fail, it's very disappointing. We were in a race, not last year, the year before. And the uh, attachment to the boom from the sheet broke in the middle of a race. It was blowing 25, gust to 30. We were in front. We were in great shape. The damn thing broke, and we had to retire. Very disappointing. Very disappointing. And you don't want to dis It's disappointing as an owner, as a skipper, and it's disappointing as a, a crew member. So keeping your, your equipment in good shape is important. It's part of the battle. And it's, and it's not as hard. It, it may get expensive at times, but it's not as hard as people want to think. A lot of people do their own work. If you don't know how to do the work, ask somebody. YouTube. Anybody here use YouTube? How do I clean my winch? Boom, boom, boom. YouTube. I have a, I have a Lumar winch. You're going to find a video how to do it. How do, I, how do I sand my bottom? YouTube. YouTube's your friend. Um, let's talk more uh, about lines. So I'm going to bring up Halsey, Halsey Bullen. He is one of the premier line people here at Cedar Point. Um, he's the one I ask all the questions to. I uh, started racing big boats when Steve was about this high, so I've been around for a while too. What is it with lines? Okay, rope, lines when you use them on a boat. Uh, these days, most lines are strong enough that you're not going to break them in use. If you have a line that breaks, it, you shouldn't have been using it. The key thing about lines that are used to trim the sails is stretch. Do they stretch? How much do they stretch? And what's the pattern? Sometimes stretch is your friend. Some of you may remember doing some splicing a year ago with line that looked like this. This is the, one of the leftovers. A dock line or a line to attach a buoy to, uh, it helps if it's stretched. That's, that's how it reacts to good weather and, and keep your, keeps your boat in good shape. So it's a positive. This line's made of nylon, just like some stockings, and it was the first artificial material used to substitute for things like sisal and jute and manila that used to be the standards 100 years ago. And it's good, it's very strong, and much stronger than the similarly sized natural fibers, but uh, it stretches a lot, like maybe 5%, a little more than that under stress, something like that. It's supposed to in the, in the configurations you have. But that's not what you want on a line that's adjusting your sails. If your sails, you've got a halyard holding them up, you've got a sheet trimming them, you've got perhaps a, a, a traveler line, uh, an outhaul pulling it out, maybe a Cunningham pulling it down. Those are lines that you want to hold in the position that you want to hold them in. And if they stretch, you run into a problem. Why is that? Think about the sail. If you have a sail, one of the principles of it is that if it's not very windy, you have ease the sheets, ease the halyards, so you have a nice big shape, powerful shape, so you can get going even though there isn't much wind. 
It's the opposite. When the wind comes up, you want it tighter and tighter and tighter. The sails are designed that way. And if you're trying to go upwind, it's really important to have that. So if you have a line that stretches, first you set it up, you're going fairly well. The wind suddenly puffs from 10 knots to 20 knots. What happens? That's a lot of force on the line. The lines are fairly long, 50, 50 feet up for a typical main halyard, for example. And what happens if the line's stretchy? It eases the sail. It makes the sail more round, bulkier, and it makes you overpowered and unable to deal with the situation. That's really bad if you get a puff. That, that happens, you can go out of control pretty easily. So that's the centerpiece of a lot of what's going on with, uh, with ropes and accounts for a lot of competition. How do you know if your rope stretches? The, the standard used to be Dacron or polyester lines. That, that was the, the follow-on to nylon. Not, not as stretchy. Brought it down to maybe 3% stretch in the, in the typical sailing environment. And so that's better. Uh, but 3%, what's 3% of 50 feet? It's kind of a lot when you think about it. So if you're stretching anything like that, if you're stretching even this much, it's not so good. So uh, line technology continues to improve on that. And the current standards are a couple of different approaches that have greatly reduced it. The one I'll talk about a little today, which is the one I like better, is called Dyneema. It used to be called Spectra, but uh, a Dutch company uh, took it over and they liked the Dutch name, so it came out Dyneema. That's the name people use for it now. Uh, and that, that's a lot stronger. It's a little tougher on the hands, so it is common to use polyester ropes as the cover and the, and the core of the very, very strong and very not so stretchy Dyneema. And I've got some examples of these kinds of lines. Uh, there are still all polyester lines, but they really are going to sag if the, if the breeze comes up. It's very difficult to control your sails with them. Now, the first thing is, what's the condition of your line? If your line looks like this, you can pass this around. That's not new line, that's old line. Now it's polyester and all of that. If your line looks like that, even if it doesn't have the big things hanging off it like the one Steve <laughs> did, that's I don't think right. it's, it's unlikely that it's good. Even if it looks nice, here's, a, here's one that looks nice. We used to use this. Um, mm -hmm. It's polyester uh, with a polyester core and looks nice and shiny. And it's nice and flexible, feels nice on the hand. This is a polyester thing, pass, pass them on back. And the only disadvantage of it is it's really stretchy. I finally, Steve and I were debating whether to continue using the line and I demonstrated to him, which I can't really do here by pulling down on the line from 50 feet down, that it was really stretchy and it was unsuitable, even though it looks okay. So that leaves you with other things. This is an example of what you would typically see. Now, this is not a new line, but it's still a good one. It has a Dyneema core, typically small, a little slippery, and not very big. You look at it and say, Phew, how can that work? Well, it does because they use heat uh, technology and they don't just heat it up, they, they pull it in some clever, fancy way to do it, and they keep improving it. This is Dyneema SK-75, I even labeled it, um, which was the first one that was pretty good. It cut it down below 2%, 1 to 2% in certain conditions. And from this, you can, again, pass it, pass it back. You can see how nice it is to feel the cover as opposed to having to try to hold on to the core. But the cover isn't very strong. And 
It comes in various colors and shapes. Here's another one here so that you guys on this side can look at it. You probably already got lines like this, maybe, or you've encountered them, but you want to do that. The, uh, the stretch characteristics continue to improve, and uh, 75 has been improved to 78, which is down below 1%. And the latest one is SK99. Notice that the numbers are going up. So are the prices. <laughs> SK99. And that's, uh, that's real good. In fact, this is, this is Espresso's main halyard. Try not to gum it up, but take a look at it. It's got SK99 core. This one, I believe, came from came from Europe. I've forgotten who the manufacturer was. It was a matter of trying to find somebody who had it. And it comes with a, a reasonably good cover. You can take a look at this as well. And again, it's got a core. Notice that the core isn't very big. It's six millimeters. We have a 37-foot boat with a giant mainsail on it, and this is sufficient to hold it up and not stretch, hardly at all. Well under 1%. Still a little bit of stretch. Still, the, you know, the 55 or whatever feet it is that we've got on the hoist will still stretch some, but better. Some other subtleties about it. If you tie... I'm sorry? Yes, that's our halyard. <laughs> One way to put an end on a, on a halyard. We'll never find the body. And attach it to our sail. Yeah, remember that big number. <laughs> it's expensive. You can, you can end a sail like this with a bowline. You can attach that to your sail. Some of you may still do that, or with another knot like this. A disadvantage of this knot is that people have found out by extensive testing, this reduces the strength of the line in the area of here by 50%. 50% reduction if you do it that way. If you do it with a splice like the halyard here or a couple of the other ones and it comes out right, you have a maybe 5% reduction in stress. So if your halyards haven't been spliced, or, and I'm talking halyards, sheets, same thing. They ought to be. I can do it. It's not rocket science. Making this rope is rocket science. I don't know how they do it, but but uh, it's easy enough to splice it and 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 have it come out. So my advice is take a look at your rope. Oh, how long do ropes last? Everything wears out. Everything wears out. So. After your sails may only last, may only be in super racing shape for three years, the rope will last maybe twice that if, every, if you take good care of it. But if it's been on your rope since, been on your boat since, I don't know how long this has been on the boat, take a look at it. Take a check. Also, as part of the preseason, run your fingers over the lines. Are there any hiccups? Are there any breaks in the line? Look at it falling apart. There may be friction at a tight spot or, or something sticking out of the shaft or something like that. It may be roughed up in the area of the uh, where you're trimming, on either from the winch or from the stopper. Eventually that will get to you. You can fix that in some ways. If it's there's friction in one point, you can shorten maybe the line so that the friction point isn't stressed anymore. You can do that. Finally, one, one more item. You notice that this is the main halyard on our boat, and it's not on the boat. It was in storage in my house. Now, why is that? Because every year, I, and maybe you, should take off all the critical lines on the boat, wash them, and give them a rest. Substitute some old crappy line or, or a, a messenger to do that. If you, what? I put them in a sink with a little bit of hand soap and whoosh them around for a while 
and then I rinse that out, and then I uh, rinse them out again until the, until the water is no longer black, because you will find that your ropes are dirty. Uh, that helps the rope, and uh, obviously it's a little nicer on the hand, and just not having it up on the mast in the winter is obviously going to extend the life of your line. So check out your, your line. If it's old, tired, if you have had already problems with the sails, with the line stretching uh, and when a puff hits, you're probably a candidate for this. I do this for other people. A lot of people do this for other people. There's a lot of different lines. There's a lot of bewildering explanations and technology on the rope. And oh, you, you can hardly tell $3, 50 cent a foot line from $1 line until you set it. Then you can tell. So, so the, the some thoughts on rope. Question. Well, no. The rope is actually stronger. The this rope. modern rope is this actually SK. stronger, weight for weight. And the stretch factor, everybody thinks wire doesn't stretch. Not not quite. That is a downside of using the, the line, is there will be some stretch. Uh, most of it bounces back. Some of there's something called creep uh, that makes it advisable not to leave your Dyneema halyard under full stress a lot of the time. So that's a that, that's and it's true to some extent of other things. If you have a jib that's rolled up that you leave up for three months all summer, you might want to relax that halyard from time to time to avoid that kind of problem. Yeah, the halyard will just last less. It'll last less long. Um, using it on a roll of furling. Like, and, the, and the other reason is you have to splice the wire to a rope. I do wire rope splices. You don't even want to do that. I mean, you don't have to anymore. Don't do it. These three types of rope, the SK99, 78, 75. Um, and, you know, this is less money than this. And this, you know, this is the most expensive one. Uh, it's stronger than it's stronger than cable. So uh, it's got a higher breaking strength. Everything we have on a boat has a breaking strength, lines, blocks. So you have to be aware of that, what the loads are on your boat. And uh, appropriately uh, attach the equipment to the boat that is that's designed to handle the load, that's designed to land, handle those loads. And that's really important in here. We have, on our boat, we have a backstay that's made out of line, SK99. It's stronger than the, the steel, the, the stainless steel that came with the boat. Stainless steel, it's stronger. It has a higher breaking strength. Um, that's great. Lines are good. We love line. It's expensive. Um, if you don't, if you don't know how to splice it, it's even more expensive to pay someone to do it. So if you want to take up a hobby, uh, learn to splice. It's not hard. Winter pastime. Hmm? Winter pastime. So winter pastime. Um, once, once, uh, once we have all our lines set, we got to talk about. Sales. How long does this racing sail last? Well, that depends. What's it made out of? There's a lot of different materials in sails. You know, we have Dacron. Dacron, nice white sails. As long as they stay white, they look nice, but they do stretch. But they last probably, they're probably the most durable sail material out there. And now we can go all the way to you know, there's Kevlar, carbon, carbon fiber sails, there's aramid sails, which are a mixture of different materials, whether it's Technora, and I'm not going to get into that, but there's, different, there's definitely different levels of sails you can buy, and some last longer than others. Um, and if you're worried about longevity, 
mention it to your sale maker, and they'll work with you to get something that you'll be happy with. It'll give you enough performance that you're happy, and it'll last longer or maybe not so long as what you've had in the past. Um, they're really making great strides in uh, material these days. Um, now, I think the number one question I ask when I go to buy a sale is, how much does it weigh? I think weight's important. Everybody doesn't think, you know, Dacron sale, my Dacron, 135% jib, weighs more than twice what my carbon fiber racing jib weighs. And that's weight aloft, right? It's a weight on my back when I have to drag it up to the bow, right? Nobody wants to carry uh, heavy sails. Um, but if you're if you're doing a lot of racing, you want to you want to get more racing type sails because the next guy's got them. And you want to beat the next guy, or you want to be competitive. And uh, everybody here is not going to finish first, but you want to feel like you've done that you're doing well enough that satisfies you out on the water. You don't have to win every race. Nobody wins every race. Um, the best racers in this club don't win every race. Some win more than others, and that's probably appropriate. Um, but all the things we're talking about so far, if the stuff's in good shape, you, you're putting your best foot forward. You're starting properly. You're prepared, all right? And sales are no different. Having the right sails for the conditions that you're sailing in is also important. If you have a big boat um, and you, uh, your sails are too big, you don't have a small enough sail for the wind conditions, the boat just heels over and it's just very difficult to deal with. If you, have, if you don't have big enough sail for the conditions, you know, I left that number one back on the dock because I thought it was going to be heavy today. That's not good because you don't have the tool that you need. And there's different sales for different conditions, different points of sale. And, the, and having them in good shape, sales have holes in them, have a tendency to destroy themselves. Every once in a while, you get a little hole in the sail, a seam maybe rip, or something gets poked. Get it fixed right away. Don't put it off. You may put a hand patch on it. That hand patch is going to last so long. And then what happens to a sail if you don't if you have a hole in it? It gets bigger. Everybody, anybody ever have a crack in their windshield that got bigger every week? Same things with sail. You have a little tear, and then a bigger tear, and a bigger tail, bigger tear, then then you destroy the whole thing and you gotta start over. And that's not cheap. Um, so Make sure your sails are in good shape. Do I have the right sails for the racing that I do or the sailing that I do? And this goes for, you know, coastal cruisers. You know, they'll pick something different than a, a local racer will. And a guy's sailing around the world is going to pick something different than somebody here at Cedar Point's going to have. So the sails for everybody. Just got to work with your uh, sail rep to get the right thing for you. And conversation is the thing. There's no, there's no cookie cutters when it comes to sailing. Unless you're in a one design boat and this is what you got, right? Like John, what do you do? What do they do in the, in the Flying Scott? You don't have choices, do you? Don't have choices. It's all one design. It's all one design. You can use different, different manufacturers, right? But they have to be cut exactly the same. And that's the essence of one design. Um, what else is important on a boat? To be make sure it's in good shape. Electronics? How about electronics? How about a GPS? How many people race around race out here in in the in the fixed mark racing area? How many people have a GPS with all those waypoints in it? That's good. That's good. If you don't, you're just following people. You don't know where you're going. Um, we've all started. Hey, when we all first started racing here at Cedar Point, even myself included, I just followed people. 
My first year, I just followed people around. Even though I had the had this stuff in the charts, I mean, I had the, the GPS and everything, you still just follow people around because you got to learn the area. But how many races do you win following people around? None. All right. Um, but no, so it's important to make sure your GPS has batteries, make sure your electronics work. Depth sounder, is that important? Sometimes. Sometimes. Coming in here, you know, you can get caught in the wrong place in the channel. If you're on your way out and you get stuck in the mud and you got to wait an hour and a half, you miss, you miss the race. It's disappointing. If it's Wednesday night and you get stuck on the way back in, you miss dinner. <laughs> is that important? It's all about a positive, having a positive experience. Um, so electronics are important. You know, wind indicator. Um, when I first started sailing on the J24, we had a Windex. We had a depth sounder and a speedo. That's it. We never GPS. The orange marks up there. You know, they need a GPS. But in today's environment, you know, if, if, if it's a, one of the distance races we run here, you can be going across to Port Jefferson. It's over there somewhere, right? But you don't want to go here and then have to come back here. Sailing longer is not good. So having a working GPS with all the waypoints pre-installed is probably the way to go. And, you know, instruments, are, they'll tell you, when it's time to go to the bathroom nowadays. You don't need all that stuff. It's nice, but I find that skippers that watch the numbers are distracted. They're not sailing straight. They're not the ones that are supposed to be watching all those numbers. Who, who watches the numbers? The navigator or tactician. Let them watch the numbers. Let them say, you know, let them say, hey, we got to head up 10 degrees for that mark. If you're driving the boat and you're watching all those numbers ticking and ticking and ticking, what are you not watching? You're not watching the telltales, the Windex, the other boats around you, right? So it's important to have the stuff work. If it doesn't work, um, it's not the end of the world. We didn't always have, I mean, if I didn't have a Speedo, how do I know I'm going fast enough? And I'm, I'm serious. I'm not, that's not a joke. How do I know I'm going the speed I'm supposed to be going? If in 10 knots upwind, I'm supposed to be, uh, my target speed is six and a half knots. If I'm going four knots, I know something's wrong. So it helps if it's working. If it doesn't work, it's, that doesn't help. That's just another way to be prepared. All right, what's the first thing we do when we get up in the morning? We're going to go sailing, whether it's racing or just cruising out or maybe taking a powerboat out someplace. What's the first thing we're going to do? You're going to check what? The weather. How many people have a smartphone? Everybody has a smartphone. What weather app do you use on your smartphone? Which one comes with an iPhone? The weather channel, right? I have found that that is one of the most reliable sources for this area. Why? Who owns the Weather Channel? Oh, yeah. IBM. Who has the fastest computers? IBM. I worked for IBM for a long time. I've seen the fast. I've seen the computers the size of this room that run that program, or that runs their model. It's, it's awesome, and everybody's got something. But I've always found, and you can you weather underground and all these other places, I've always found the Weather Channel, for me, now you may not like it, but for me, it gives me the best information. And it's right, it comes right with my phone. I don't have to buy the app. It's there. It's simple. But you can use anything you want. 
whatever you trust, whatever you think is the best. And in another area, it might not be the best. Right? Predict, predict when. <laughs> predict when. There's a hundred apps. Literally, there's a hundred. It's one of the reasons I like the Weather Channel one is because it it's one it's one source. Well, it's probably multiple sources, but it's one story. John, you got some? That's history. That's it's history for that point. Yeah. And that's good because maybe that's coming to you. Right? right? Um, so predicting the wind is not our forte here or anybody in this room. Uh, but there's a lot of information out there. And it really doesn't matter where you get it. It's all going to be pretty good. I trust things better than others, but there's people that will disagree with me. And we can debate it all day. Um, because everybody has their own opinion. But weather forecasting is what we look at in the morning. Is it going to rain? Is it going to be 50 degrees? Is it going to be 80 degrees? Is it going to be windy or not windy? Those are, the, those are the decisions we have to make before we leave the house. Why? Because we have to know what clothes to bring with us. You're not going to bring everything in your closet on a race boat. You're going to want to you want to bring appropriate gear. Now, I'll give you an example. I had a crew member that didn't have foul weather gear. Every time it rained, and this was a rainy year, he asked me to borrow my foul weather gear or an extra set. I said, "Okay." The first time, the second time, the third time. The fourth time, the fifth time, I said, you're cold and you're wet, 100 bucks. <laughs> you want to borrow $100 for the day or stay wet, stay cold, and we're not going back. Was that mean? He chose not to be prepared. He knew he was supposed to be prepared. He chose not to be prepared. And let me tell you, if you're cold and wet, you will pay that $100. You will pay $300. You will pay $500 to no longer be cold and wet, especially if you're going to be out for a few hours, because that's miserable. We've all been there. We've all been caught without the right stuff. You know, whether it's you going to the supermarket, leaving your house tonight. I was in the house all day. I walked outside. I didn't have a jacket on. I ran back in, and I got my jacket. Did he come back the next week? He, he, he bought himself a foul weather jacket. <laughs> for the next week. That was his program. Your problem was My problem. I have a spare one in case you forget, not don't own. Okay? If he had just forgot it once in a while, and that's what it's there for. I have a spare set on the boat. It'll fit. It might not fit you perfectly, but it'll keep you dry. Right? It's not for the guy that he was new. Um, he wasn't a new sailor, but he was new to the crew, and he just didn't go out. And not like he couldn't afford it. He made more money than I did, you know? So 
he wasn't prepared and he chose not to be prepared, but he became prepared when when he had to, when he had to. Engine maintenance. That important? Like anything else. Anything neglected? Brakes. Check the oil. You have, do you have fuel? When we bought the Express 37 from a sail maker, his, his idea of the right amount of fuel was my idea of having no fuel. He installed, he ran out of fuel so often, he installed an electric fuel pump on his 18 horsepower Yanmar. Well, that causes more problems. Too much pressure. Um, we removed it. But his line, his full line, was my empty line on the gas tank. There's no, you, you ruin your engine, you keep running out of fuel. It doesn't like to run without fuel. Um, you ruin your batteries. And then you got to sit there and pump that little thing a hundred times. To get the air out when you put fuel in. Um, but that's, it's important. Does the fuel gauge work? I don't know. Does it work? Does your boat have a fuel gauge? Um, and that doesn't matter as long as there's fuel in the tank. You're good. But you got to know how much is in your tank. Um, crew preparation. What do we do to prepare our crew? How many people here are crew? There's a lot of skippers preparing their crew tonight. That's why you're here. So you're prepared. Um, so that's a good thing. Inexperienced crew and unprepared crew, um, I'm not going to say it's dangerous. It could be dangerous, not necessarily. Um, that depends on the size of the boat and how many of them there are, how many people know something and how many people don't. If you're the only one that knows how to steer the boat and you fall off, who's coming to get you? Nobody. Nobody. So what do you do? Wear a life jacket all the time. No one can drive the boat back to pick you up. And we, hey, four or five years ago, we had an Atlantic skipper fall off the boat. The crew didn't know what to do. He was still floating. We had, he did not have a life jacket on. He had a life jacket in the boat. I think they might have thrown one to him. But the guy was, you know, the guy that was on the boat had no idea. Calls the, I was on race committee. He calls the race committee and says, uh, the skipper fell over and I don't know how to drive a boat. And I'm headed for the rocks. Okay, we'll be right there. <laughs> Send a chase boat over to help him out. Send a chase boat over to pluck the guy out of the water. Um, but that's part of being prepared. You have the right people on the boat. Now, the worst thing to do as a boat owner that has a good, well-prepared boat is to go to a regatta with the wrong crew or not enough crew. I've been there. I've done it. You know, you have, you have, you have uh, moments of glory that come with a lot of defeat. So a well-trained crew, and some of you guys are in the right direction, uh, is, very, is, is important. And nobody that wins every week or a lot has bad crew. They usually have the same crew. And it's hard. It's very hard to keep the same crew. So how do you keep the same crew? Bribery. Bribery. Good. <laughs> Someone knows something. Nice. Hmm? Nice. Having a nice, all the things that we talked about, being prepared. Right? Makes people want to come back. When they see a nice boat, they want to come back. When they see a messy boat, they're like, eh, you know, I don't like racing with that guy. He yelled at me. Why did he yell at you? Were you going to kill him? Were you on the way to kill somebody or yourself? And he yelled at you to make you stop doing something that you shouldn't have been doing? Maybe. 
But yelling on a boat doesn't, doesn't work. Believe me, I know. I've tried it. It doesn't work. People don't like it. The, even the people not involved. If you're yelling at the guy in the bow and you're out of control and you're driving the boat or the guy in the bow is yelling at the skipper, no, the people in, in between don't like it. Nobody likes that. Um, do people yell on boats? Yeah, occasionally. Do I yell? Eh, once in a while. Try not to. I'm much better than I used to be. That's for, that's for darn sure. Um, and it does take, take a lot of practice to be able to get things across without screaming. Now, don't confuse speaking loudly so that the person on the bow can hear you as yelling. That's not yelling. That's just enunciating. And some people enunciate higher than others. Right? Your wife agrees with me. But anyway, um, you don't want to, if you have someone on your crew berating another person on the crew because they did something wrong, that's not good. That's demoralizing for the whole crew, not just the person that's getting uh, yelled at. So I'm not just talking about skipper yelling at crew. I'm talking about crew yelling at crew. You know, calling somebody a name, telling them that they suck. Right? No, there's, there's, no, there's no real room for that in sailboat racing. What is sailboat racing? It's a team sport. Right? If you have a weak link in the team, is the team as good as it could be? No. So the few boats that win have less and less weak links in the team. Um, I signed up for Block Island Race Week. It's a big commitment for the boat. It's a big financial commitment. I'm only going with a good crew. And I sat my crew down. I said, listen, you're the, you're the people I want to go with me. You have to go with me or I'm not going to do it. I need to know right now. And seven out of eight said yes. And one person said, ah, my parents are sick. I can't, I can't commit to a week. You know, if, if that week comes and we still need one more person and she wants to go, she can go. But I need commitments from people. And you do too. When you're sailing every Wednesday night, do you have the same people every week, Arsene? Right, and that's, that's normal. You'll have a core, you know, on a boat that has eight people, if you have four or five core people that come every week, that's great. The rest of them can fill in. Um, and there's uh, basically seven jobs on the boat. Uh, and any extra after that, and this is a boat that races spinnaker, um, it's nice to have an extra pair of hands running around, especially an extra pair. Depends on your boat. Um, if you're J29 or I would, I would, if I was racing, I raced a J30 for a long time, so did Halsey. Uh, mostly racing spinnaker, but J29, I, four or five. Three gets dicey, especially if you have to um, pull out the jib and stuff. If you're just going to sit in the cockpit, three is, two is okay, you know, but there's nobody on the rail. And the J29 needs people on the rail, right? That's the, one of the success points to a J29. You know Hustler, right? Boat Hustler, J29. He used to, he used to have nine. 980 pound guys on the rail and he took a rating hit because he wanted heavy crew but that's the way that boat was designed and you know uh we had the express 37 it needed weight on the rail it was important the x37 i have now it's important but it's not as critical as it was on those other boats on the j30 or the or, or the uh, express 37 because those were lighter boats john Generally, because something wasn't fixed, right? 
something that wasn't done is generally didn't ask the question. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, every time I go on a, a, a another boat and uh, and sail with a different skipper, I watch. How does he handle it? Is he successful? How does he handle his crew? But what John's talking about is just communication, and communication is. Not only what you can do is you have to know where you're supposed to be at every point in the race. If you're not sure where you're supposed to be, you have to you got to find out because you're going to be in the wrong place some at some point. Uh -oh. Whenever I ask for something, I would like the person on the other end to acknowledge it, maybe nod of the head yeah. or answer, because otherwise I don't know if they heard me. That's right. And if they didn't, it's a hurt. And the first time you saw, yeah, and that's very important because the first time I ask someone to do something, and it, nothing happens. You ask again, you get louder each time. And the frustration level goes up each time. Right? So if you have someone that chit chatting on the rail about, you know, what they had for breakfast, or uh, what movie they saw last week, or what show they like to watch, they're not paying attention. And that's another part of, of keeping the crew involved. Now, I sail with uh, Special Olympics athletes, um, and I've been doing it for a long time. And they like to talk, not necessarily about what you were doing. So I ask when they start going off topic, you know, oh, I'm, let me tell you about my sister. I, you know, I'm in the middle of a race. You know, there's 20 seconds to go before the gun, and she wants to talk to me. And, you know, that's okay. I ask a question. What does that have to do with sailing? And they look at me. And these are all people that are intellectually challenged. They look at me, and they understand that's right, we're sailing, we're not, we're not chit-chatting here. Um, and it's not mean, it's not, keeping people focused is important. And a, a good skipper will keep everybody focused. And chit-chatting on the rail about nonsense or stuff that does, has nothing to do with the race. Now there's things you want them to chit-chat about. Are we going faster than that boat? Is that boat pointing higher? That's communication. Those are the communicate. That's the communication we need. If we're not paying attention, anybody ever fall asleep during the middle of a race? I fell asleep driving a J24 in New York Harbor in the Governor's Cup in 1980 something. It was 95 degrees out, and there was very little wind. And I'm, I'm concentrating. I'm concentrating. I'm concentrating, and then I fell asleep. I mean, not for long. <laughs> People were starting to yell at me. <laughs> Wake up! But I'm not talking about falling asleep. I'm talking about just paying attention, just general paying attention to what's going on. If if something's happening, 
that could be a dangerous situation. And you, hey, we're going, you know, seven knots, and we're close. We're always close to other boats. And one of the things about racing sailors is that we're, we're not afraid of a boat being a foot away, or two feet away, or five feet away. Before any of you came to came to uh, racing, maybe you had some cruising experience, or just tooling around on boat experience. You get up to the line and everybody's right next to each other. I mean, you're inches from one another. It's intimidating. If the crew is not paying attention, or you're not paying attention as the skipper, that's going to be a problem. And that's all part of you know having a mindset about what, what you expect from your crew and your skipper is important. Because you guys all have to be on the same page, otherwise it's not going to work. How do you become good at something? Practice. Practice. Or get lucky. One of my favorite quotes was a quote from Arnold Palmer. I'd rather be lucky than skillful any day of the week. But the more I practice, the luckier I get. And it's true. It's true with anything. He's playing golf, but it's true in sailboat racing. It's true in baseball. It's true in football, basketball. The more you practice, the luckier you get. And you're right, you'd rather be lucky. You'd rather that wind shift come that nobody expected, right? Wasn't in the forecast. If you're on the right side of that shift, you were lucky. If you're on the wrong side of the shift, not so lucky. It makes the guy, the lucky guy looks really smart. But, you know, half the time, it's luck. You know, you know I, we do the vineyard race. It's 239 miles. It takes Two and a half days. People talk about, should I go on the Long Island side or stay on the Connecticut shore? You know what that is? Half of that? Half of it? There, there is some knowledge that you can put towards it all. Flip a coin. You're not going to do as well as someone that's educated, guessing edu with education. You know, an educated guess is better than just a guess. Right? But it's all a coin flip. Um, John, you've been on PRO and the wind shifts 180 degrees. Did you expect it? Most of the time? I'm looking at our <laughs> The competitors aren't looking at our tech. Do they expect 180 degree wind shift? No, nobody does. I mean, you know it's going to be shifty. That may be part of the forecast. But going from 90 to 180, or 0 to 180, you know, a 45 or, or you know, 100 or a 90 degree shift, or that, that's not normal. So, are you going to predict that at, at 2:15 in the afternoon, between 2:15 and 2:30, the wind's going to shift 90 degrees and then shift back? If you tell me that you know that's going to happen, you are a liar. Now, you can tell me that it's likely that it's going to happen, right? It could be forecast that there's going to be shifty, but exact timing, not. So the more you educate yourself about the weather, about sailing in general, I mean, people have taken classes, you know, longshore, sound sailing. Um, we had the seminar. There's a lot of Cedar Point people on it. Um, the Dave Dellenbau seminar on sail trim. How many, anybody take that? That's a handful of people. Um, he's offering one on tactics next week. Starts. I think it's it's not going to be as good a deal as the one we got for uh, sail trim, but uh, it's a good thing to do. It's all part of preparation. Should the crew take it? Yeah. Now Dave Downbow is really nice. He said all of the sessions are being were being recorded, as this is. Um, his was all over Zoom, so it was easier. Um, and he said that we could share it with our crew, but he said made us promise that we would only share it with our crew. 
So, Jessica, I'm going to send you the link. <laughs> um, but how do we keep crew? How, how do you keep the same guy coming back? Beer? Beer is what? Feed and water the crew. Feeding and watering the crew is the first rule of keeping crew. Making them smile at the end of the day. Right? That's important. Treating them like you can't do it without them is important. Because guess what? You can't. You can't do it alone. That's right. The guy that's writing all the checks to pays all the bills. He's an important guy. But so is everybody else. Um, teamwork, a good team wins a lot of races. And teams that prepare, all the things we did today. How many people help their skipper with boat preparation? How many say, how many think that that's not their problem? Yeah, John. You don't want to do it yourself. You just make Sean do it, right? <laughs> How many people sail with family? Brothers and sisters. John sails with his brother. I don't sail with my brother anymore. Oil and oil and oil and water. I taught him everything he knows, but he doesn't think that. <laughs> it's probably true. Um, but he calls me all the time and asks me questions. I don't understand. Um, keeping your crew happy goes a couple of, there's a couple of different things that you can do to make them happy. Appreciate them. Um, and should crew appreciate the owner? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. They should. When I was crewing on the J24 that I learned to sail on, every year we bought something for the boat, the crew. There was only five of us, so there's the skipper and four people. The four people got together and put in 25, 50, 100 bucks, whatever it is. The boat needed a new compass. We bought the compass, the skipper. I sailed with that man for 30 years. And then he sailed with me. Well, part of that 30 years, he sailed with me. When he sold his boat and I bought boats, he was my, when I had the X332, he, uh, he was my tactician. He was good. But he was an old guy. I took good care of him because he took good care of me. And that's what makes good crew. Sailed with him for a long time. People would say, you still sailing with Jerry? I'm like, yeah, why not? Paying all the bills. <laughs> um, and then I was paying all the bills. I didn't understand that. But that's the way it worked when he got older. Um, but w do you do anything to keep these guys together in the winter? Yeah. You have some get together. That's important. Communication's important. You know, it's not, not, you know everybody has their own thing. Um, and we sacrifice a lot of time during the summer to make ourselves available for every Wednesday night, every weekend, and sometimes every Wednesday night and the weekend. And sometimes when sailing's over, we all take a deep breath, we put the boat away, and we like, I don't want to hear from anybody for three months. <laughs> That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as, and when the three months are over, my crew's been hearing from me, a lot because we're planning to do Block Island Race Week. Um, and that we planned in January. So they heard from me. You know, we had the awards dinner in November. In December, I said Merry Christmas to all of them, sent them a note or, you know, some kind of social media thing. And uh, then in January, I called them and said, Hey, you want to do this? And they all said yes. Uh, 
Um, not usually. Occasionally. Um, and and that, 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 that's a big I depend. Um, we have certain people that know how to do certain things really, really well. And when we go out as a team, we want everybody in their best spot. Um, and we try to do that, but sometimes somebody's missing, and then we, ro we, we rotate people around. Um, and you want also every member to know a little bit of yes, that's true. your position. When we, so when we, that's right. I mean, almost everybody on the boat can do almost every other job. I mean, four-deck is a specialty in a spinnaker boat. Um, certain people don't want anything to do with it. And certain people, you don't want anything. You don't want them having anything to do with it. My nephew sails with me. He's 220 pounds. I don't want him anywhere near the bow. He'll go put the head sail on before we leave the dock. <laughs> but in a race, I don't want him up there. One at a time. Um... We start, uh, when I start training people, um, they're assigned to watch and pay attention and to help out where needed. When they get a few races under their belt, we'll give them, you know, depending upon who shows up that day, we'll move them into a position. Um, but uh, most, most of them do this the same positions most of the time, I have to say. Because that's just, I mean, you have someone's the best driver, someone's the best main sheet trimmer, someone's the best jib trimmer. Uh, when, you have a, when you have a boat um, that has uh, heavy loads on the jib, some, some people can handle it and some people can't. And it's not, you know, you, you, you want the burly guy on the jib because he's going to get it in faster. Not that someone, you know, my wife doesn't want to do the jib. She can't get it in fast enough. She doesn't want anything to do with it. Is that when you yell at No. <laughs> what works with me, John, what works with me is she's in the bow. She's 36 feet away on a 37-foot boat. <laughs> Perfect. So does anybody have anything that they uh, have questions about? Can you effectively navigate and steer or steer and navigate? No. I mean, yes and no. Star I mean, sailors do it. Usually, usually, John seems to do it because nobody else wants to. Um, but um, it depends. Out here on a Wednesday night, <clears throat> You know, they put the course up. I know where all the marks are. I've done it so many times. Navigation is simple. But that's just going, navigation is going from point A to point B, right? So if you're on uh, a distance race and you have to go through the race, Fisher's Island, the gut, you have to pick the spot, or you have to go around a certain buoy that's 20 miles away, no, you can't act. You can't navigate and steer and do it effectively. But, you know, if you're out here and there's a windward mark and a leeward mark, there's no navigation simple. So, yeah, in that situation, you could. Um, but you still need the crew to help you with other things. Is there a puff coming? Is there a wave coming? Right? Are we being headed? Are we being lifted? We'll talk a lot about that next week. Um, so you can in certain circumstances, but generally it's, it's probably a better idea that someone else is doing the navigation. Because if I'm, if I'm steering and I'm looking at the compass uh, and trying to figure out things, I'm not paying attention to the telltale. You, when you're driving a boat, you have to be focused. You want to make the boat go fast. And I used to tell my friend Jerry, that was my tactician, I'm driving the boat. If you don't tell me to tack, we're going to go right into the beach. 
That's not my job. That's your job. And he used to say, Steve makes the boat go fast. If we screw up, the boat went fast in the wrong direction. It's my fault. Right? Because we had that understanding that he was telling me where to go. I was making the boat go as fast as possible in whatever direction he pointed. He said, head up 10 degrees. I head up 10 degrees. If that was too close, I would tell him, no, I can't head up 10 degrees. Because it was my job to make the boat go fast. So if the boat slowed down too much, I'd say, no, I can't do that. And that would depend on you know, wind conditions and, and the like. So it all depends. And that, a lot of these questions are, it all depends. It's not a, uh, uh, nothing's cut and dried except for dock lines. Do not make good halyards or sheets. <laughs> Do halyards and sheets make good dock lines? <clears throat> and I'll tell you why that answer is no. They don't stretch. There was a guy that used to sail, Long Island Sound, he, he doesn't sail here anymore. Probably doesn't have one. He had a 36 7 Tango. You remember that boat? It was before your time. He tied his boat up with old jib sheets. It was, a, it was a hurricane. He was tied to the dock. And his winches were on the dock. The boat was. <laughs> his winches were on the dock. No, no joke. He pulled the winches right off the dock. So that's where stretch. It's important. If you're in an anchor, do you want stretch? Yes. Yeah, because you want it to ease back. You don't want it to come back and stop short. If you're in a halyard or a sheet, now you might not need SK99 for your jib sheets. It's a little overkill. What do we use? 75? 78. 78. There's no need to go to that extra. Two dollars a foot, but most of our halyards are ninety-nine or backstage ninety-nine. Uh, spinnaker halyard ninety-nine or no. not yet? It's not as important as a spinnaker halyard, in my opinion, because yeah. um, the spinnaker itself is is going to flex a little bit and it's, it's, it's not going to uh, change your angle of attack sharply as it does if you. Okay, we took. <laughs> Yeah, we talked about a lot of stuff. Boat bottoms. I can tell you what I use. VC offshore, spray, not roll. Why? Why do I spray and not roll? It's more even. Hmm? I can get it pretty even with a roller. More even. No, I can get it pretty even. If you're a good roller, you can get it even. It's not the evenness that, that the problem. It's the brush marks. Or the roller marks. When you spray, it's smooth like the table. With brush marks, it's like, you know, there's little dimples. Do you have to tend to your boat to spray it like that? I don't do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, a, that's an art. Spraying a boat is an art, i got to tell you. People do spray their own boats, and they get what they pay for. In, in, in most things, spraying and fiberglass, and I mean, I can I can make a fiberglass patch, but you know when you start to work with gel coat and matching the color and making it so you don't see the, you know, this had a big hole in it. Now I look at the piece of paper and all I see is white. Hey, that's what you want. You want it to match. You want you want to not be able to see it when you make a repair. Um, and I know this, you know, a lot of people have older boats, and there's nicks and dings, and um, the Express 37 we had was, you know, 35-year-old boat. It, it had its wear, um, but it always looked good. It was always clean. And everybody used to be surprised. Wow, that boat looks great. 35 years old, that boat looks great. I sold it for good money, too, because it looked great. And everything worked. Right? The value, you know, if, if, if you're trying to do this on a shoestring budget, if that's all you can afford and you can still do it, that's great. But if you can afford it, 
keep stuff, keep it looking nice. It'll last longer. When you go to sell the boat, can you, you know, there's no, there's no excuse for lack of maintenance. So, homework. YouTube. <laughs> Any starting question you have, put it in YouTube. Someone's going to give you an answer. It may not be the right answer, but it's going to be an answer. It'll be informative. Um, I'm not in favor of... I use, I use the bulletin board here, or the whiteboard. And I do all my describing on the whiteboard. And I draw bad, badly, but I, it's good enough. And if all else fails, look at Rule 26 in the U.S. Sailing version of the World Sailing. Does everybody have a rule book? If you don't... Does everybody join... Is, is everybody a member of U.S. Sailing? To join U.S. Sailing, which costs 30 bucks. You join U.S. Sailing, you get a rule book for $7. Your first rule book. Every time, every, and every time they change, they have a promotion. Uh, you don't have to pay $20. And there's an app. There's an app, and it's free if you're a member. There's an app. Before next week. Do you know that everyone knows these sessions will be on YouTube by Fridays every day? Okay. Every week, uh, our goal is to put this session <coughs> on YouTube on Friday. I'll send you the link. I'll send you all the link. Everybody got a uh, note from me in the last few days, right? Yeah. Even the yep. even the even the late guys. I think I got them all. Uh, but everybody got a note, and uh, most people read the note because I see beverages, I see pens and paper. Um, if you have any questions, send me an email. If you need to, if you need me to explain something further, send me an email. We'll make a time. And I'll explain it first.